Kids, Mental Health Matters in Early Childhood is an overview of the foundations of mental health in children from zero to five and will cover the signs and symptoms of mental health concerns in infants, toddlers, and preschool age children. To do that, we have two incredible presenters with us today. Let me be the first to introduce on the next slide, Dr. Melina Aislis, who is a postdoctoral fellow from the University of Arizona, where she received her doctorate in school psychology. She completed her doctoral internship in Utah with the Jordan School District, where she conducted psychoeducational and neuropsychological evaluations and provided mental health services to children and families. She has completed all licensure requirements and will be continuing with the Developmental Evaluation Clinic at Rady Children's Hospital, San Diego. We are incredibly grateful for that. Uh, let's see. Through her extensive experience with school systems, she has expertise in school services and how to access them. So we're excited to be here with you, Dr. Eastless. Thank and of you. course, my pleasure. And then I also want to introduce to you, uh, Dr. Megan Lukasik. It always takes me a second. Lukasik, I got it has been a licensed clinical psychologist since 1998 and has worked at Rady Children's Hospital San Diego since 1999. Megan specializes in the assessment of infants and young children. She has extensive experience in diagnostic assessment of neurodevelopmental disorders and early mental health concerns, including childhood trauma. In addition to providing direct clinical service, Megan manages the hospital's developmental evaluation clinic and is the co-training director for the clinic APIC approved doctoral postdoctoral fellowship program. She is the former clinical director of Rady Children's Kid Start program, a program for children ages zero to five with complex developmental and mental health needs. So if we were in an auditorium, the crowd would go wild at this part. They'd be like, yeah, screaming, shouting. But since we can't do that, the way that you applause is with your reactions on the screen, y'all. So you hit that that clap, that heart, whatever it is, they will populate on the screen as we welcome our presenters and say thank you so much for being here with us today. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, you. yeah, so here's our agenda for what we're going to cover today. Um, we're going to be talking about mental health in early childhood. And some of you might be wondering what mental health really means or encompasses for infants and toddlers. Um, so we're going to be talking a lot about what signs and symptoms to look out for when assessing for early childhood mental health, um, you know, how to assess mental health concerns and um, how we'll talk about how trauma impacts a child's development. And then we'll uh, end on a positive note with talking about some protective factors and how we as providers can um, really promote the development of young children. So um, just, you know, as I'm going through this, I was hoping to just get a sense of um, the roles of individuals who are in the audience today. So if any, if you all would be interested in just kind of sharing, um, yeah, what your position is or kind of, um, you know, whether you're providing therapy services or doing assessment, um, you know, that would be helpful for us to know. Great. Got a lot coming in. Yeah. A lot. Nice. Like for a diverse, diverse group. That's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, I'm going to get started, but um, we'll be kind of keeping an eye out for that in the chat also. Thank you. All right. So I would like to introduce you to a man named Jim. He's 26 years old. Now picture him. He's currently incarcerated, and he's been incarcerated for most of his adult life doesn't have any family or any friends. He has a history of violent crimes and a long history of drug and alcohol use starting in childhood. So things aren't looking very good. And while uh, I'm somebody who used to work in the uh, county uh, jail system, and I do have a lot of hope and faith in our ability to rehabilitate inmates, I also know that you know there's more we can do. And one of the things would be to, let's rewind. What if we could do that? What if we could rewind Jim's life and meet him when he was 10 months old? Well, unfortunately, even then at 10 months, things were looking pretty bleak. At 10 months old, Jim, then called Jimmy, was already removed from his parents' care due to prenatal substance exposure. He'd been in three different resource or foster homes, so he'd had lots of disruptions and attachment. 
there'd been a history of domestic violence in one of the homes that he was placed. So already at 10 months old, he had a number of what we know to be adverse childhood experiences. So again, we don't have to wait till Jim is Jimmy to start acting. And I don't know if some of you who are local or maybe maybe even just came into San Diego um, were at the uh, annual We Can't Wait uh, Early Childhood Mental Health Conference last week. And that title really, I think, captures what we're trying to convey with this presentation, which is we need to act now. At 10 months old, Jimmy couldn't tell us a lot about what was going on, but we already knew that he needed our help and he needed it now, and he was gonna to continue to need it as he got older. Yeah, so to kind of put things into context and you know, we're thinking about Jim as an adult, um, you know, we wanted to share some numbers of just kind of what the scene of mental health looks like for adults and adolescents right now. Um, and so here are some numbers showing what, you know, the state of mental health looks like. And um, one in five adults in our country experience mental illness each year. Some of the most common um, mental health illnesses are anxiety and depression. Um, when you think of one in five, you know, that seems pretty staggering to think that, you know, 20% of individuals are experiencing one of those things. And, um, you know, we're a 20% of the population is still trying to be part of, you know, a contributing member of society, trying to work, trying to be a parent, trying to be a partner, things like that. And so I think it's really important to consider, you know, just, just how impactful these numbers are. Um, and one in 20 US adults experience serious mental illness, meaning they likely require some extra support um, from another individual to help them with functioning. Um, and you know, this is also really important because mental illness associated with increased risks for health problems, educational problems, occupational problems. Um, and for those of you familiar with the ACEs, the PEARLs, we'll talk a little bit about, more about that later and kind of um, you know, what risk factors there are for individuals uh, developing more of those problems later. And so, um, that was our kind of adult numbers and thinking about Jim and maybe thinking back to Jimmy and, um, you know, what the numbers look like for early childhood. And so um, the data for these statistics was collected between 2016 and 2019. And so, you know, as you all know, that was prior to 2020 in our pandemic. And so um, it's likely that these numbers are even higher than they what they were then, considering the increased stressors that families and children and our systems have all experienced um, during the pandemic and following the pandemic. And so um, you'll see that, you know, some of the most commonly diagnosed mental health disorders are ADHD, anxiety, depression, and uh, a variety of behavior problems as well. So um, almost 10% of all children have received a diagnosis of ADHD. Almost 10% have received a diagnosis of anxiety. Almost 9% have been diagnosed with some sort of behavior problem. About 4% have been diagnosed with depression. So you know, these numbers are concerning alone as they are, you know, when we think about young children, um, but the kind of more challenging part too is that these numbers are increasing over time, you know, over the years, these numbers have increased. But in addition to that, um, the you know, rates of these diagnoses increases as individuals get older. So, you know, we're catching these or we're seeing these really early on, but maybe once these children are in adolescence, then that 10% that have received an ADHD diagnosis might go up to maybe 20 or, you know. Um, so that's kind of signifying the importance of why we're talking about early childhood mental health and um, why this is such an opportune time to try to mitigate that trajectory of, of developing uh, these mental health problems later in life.
And Melina, in the chat, Owen mentioned that autism is about 2.8%, so it's up there. And absolutely, we're going to be talking quite a bit about autism spectrum disorders and neurodevelopmental diagnoses in general. So um, definitely an important area and, and definitely an, a number we've seen change a lot in the last last decade plus. Definitely. Okay. All right. So many of you might have heard about or read um, this advisory that came out from the U.S. Surgeon General um, back in August called Parents Under Pressure, the U.S. Surgeon General Advisory on the Mental Health and Well-Being of Parents. Um, and if you don't know, um, Surgeon General advisories are public statements that are meant to call attention to really significant public health issues. And um, these are advisories are meant to call immediate attention to these problems. So the fact that, you know, this is considered a kind of, you know, a, a significant public health issue and urgent public health issue, I think, you know, is something for us to pay attention to. And um, for those of us who are likely working with both parents and children, this is likely not a huge surprise to us. I'm sure we see a lot of those stressors that families experience. Um, probably most notably is financial stressors. So, um, you know, the reason that this is so monumental, um, you know, is that the parents and, you know, their, um, the ways that they parent and their caregiving has huge impacts on their children, of course. Um, and, you know, the first years of a child's life are really a critical period for development. Um, and uh, that attachment between the mom and a child or parent and child in that first year of life is really vital, vital for, you know, uh, attachment and can foster positive outcomes for the future. So when that is now there's some you know, problem with that attachment or, you know, a parent's mental health is, you know, really impacting the ability to connect with their child. Um, you know, this has ramifications for children's mental health as well. Um, and, uh, the, and so um, maternal stress in, um, during the prenatal period, even, you know, before a baby is even born. Um, so their high stress is associated with a child's future increased risk for mental health conditions. So this starts even before the baby is born, even before that attachment period, but more about the, um, you know, the physical and the biological bases of a child's development. Um, and, you know, so children who have parents who have mental health conditions, um, are at heightened risk for developing things like depression and anxiety um, and, you know, to be more impaired by these mental health conditions um, if their parents are as well. Um, and there's one study that was cited in this uh, advisory that um, says that um, if a children of a primary caregiver who reported poor mental health are four times more likely to have or general health, and two times more likely to have mental, behavioral, or developmental disorders. And then these children are more prone to cognitive, um, academic, and interpersonal relationship struggles. Um, and so, again, to refer to that conference that Megan just mentioned, the We Can't Wait conference, you know, if, if you were there last week, you probably heard one of the speakers reference um, a quote by the psychologist Winnicott that says, um, there's no such thing as an infant. And there's only an infant and somebody. So, you know, an infant, they, they cannot survive without any care from another individual. And I have found that quote to really resonate with me. And um, you know, I heard that was like, I have to include that here because this is directly tied to infant mental health. Um, and so, you know, all that to say that our early childhood mental health assessment um, really has to include assessment of the context in which the child exists. Um, and, you know, we're not just assessing things in the child, but also within kind of the family system um, in, in young children. And if we were working with Jimmy at 10 months old, we don't know much, but we do know at, at a minimum 
you know, his birth parent used drugs, right? Because he was born post-tox. And so that's, that tells us something there. And, and hopefully we get to know more to understand that, that child in the context of that family system. So important. Now we're going to switch a little and I want to give you a bit of a history lesson. We're going to start with kind of looking at when did we diagnose and, and how have we evolved over time? Well, like many things, we started with medical, right? We were looking at how to standardize information about medical uh, issues, diseases, injuries, other health problems. And we were doing that uh, in the late 1800s. And it was started by the World Health Organization and other uh, international um, centers. And they formed what was called the International Classification of Diseases, or ICD. ICD. We're now in the 10th edition or 10th version of ICD and using it regularly. I know the County of San Diego, for example, that's the, the coding that we use for, for our behavioral health system. And we use that for a long time um, and it, it did serve to communicate in a standardized way about medical issues, but it fell short because it didn't really capture all of the behavioral health or mental health issues that people were struggling with. So in 1952, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual was born, the first edition. And every 10 years or so from then, a bunch of really smart people come together and sit around and they talk about how we're talking about different diagnoses and we make changes. We're currently in the fifth edition with a text revision that happened in, in 2022 for the DSM. And that's been helpful and we talk, and there is of course mention of, of childhood disorders there. Um, however, what we found in using the DSM, certainly in the work that Melina and I do, what we're working with really young kids under the age of six, infants. You know, how do you capture infant mental health using terminology that really is, is out there for adults and, and school-aged children? Well, it, it, it just doesn't work. It's very hard to do. And uh, the organization called Zero to Three, which if you're interested in learning about uh, this age group, birth to five, the zero to three.org is a wonderful uh, resource. But they uh, came up with a diagnostic classification system called the DC Zero to Three. It's also been revised and now called the DC Zero to Five. And that does a much better job of describing some of the things that are going on in some of our littlest and most vulnerable children and infants. And these are some of the uh, different uh, diagnoses that you'll see in the DC 0 to 5 that really stand out as separate but important in capturing this age group. So sensory processing, um, as Melina was talking about, relationship disorder, really capturing like when there's a disruption there and that's impacting the child. And then also looking at things like sleeping, eating, and crying disorders. So that's that's a very helpful helpful tool to have. Unfortunately, uh, as much as zero to three and other organizations have really tried, so far we haven't been able to impact policy enough to use the DC classification system for billing, at least not in California. I think maybe some states are, are more successful. I'd be interested to hearing from anybody who's using it. Um, we are using it here in the sense of helping us to conceptualize cases. And what we do is we use what we call a crosswalk. So if we're looking at our DC booklet and thinking about a child who has sleep issues, then we're gonna be able to crosswalk that to the closest uh, version of a sleep disorder in the DSM and the ICD-10. And that's how we'll kind of be able to still hold true to the description of what's going on with the child and I think do a better job at, at meeting the child and, and really talking about what's happening while also getting paid for the work that we're doing. Okay, so in the chat, the next thing that uh, we'd like to do is talk about, um, we'd like to talk about trauma. And the reason for that is we wanna, when we're, when we're diagnosing, you know, I mentioned medical and the ICD and how we often start with, with thinking about um, what's, what might be going on medically. And that's very responsible and an important thing to do. If I'm seeing a child that has a developmental delay in language, the first thing I'm gonna do is make sure that they can hear. That's a really important thing to rule out. The other important thing to rule out though is trauma. And so again, 
here's where the chat part comes in. Uh, if you can start listing anything that you can think of that is indicative of trauma. What are some events that maybe you're aware of that you would classify as traumatic experiences? See, domestic violence, good. Loss of housing, bedwetting, child abuse, neglect, divorce, separation, death, loss of a sibling, child abuse, death of a parent, car accidents, attachment issues, sexual abuse, COVID, moving, verbal abuse, death, great. And the list goes on. And I think those are more, those are all really important. Um, there are different types of trauma, but what we're talking about here is events, different events that have come up. Um, we can classify them in different ways. So thinking about an acute trauma, like a one-time event, I see bullying up there. So maybe the, you were bullied one time, but it had an, a significant impact on you. Chronic, of course, would be bullying over time. And then complex trauma would be something that's happening over time, a traumatic experience by someone important to that person. Really complicated by the fact that, gosh, this person who's supposed to care and, and love me is actually creating harm to me. So I'm in my office here and if I look up, I don't know if this is true for you guys, but if I look up, I see a, some ceiling tile that looks pretty similar to what's pictured in the slide here. Now my ceiling tile fortunately doesn't have any damage to it, but the one in the ceiling, and the, excuse me, in the picture here does. And what I'd like you to uh, envision is, let's pretend that all of a sudden a piece of, of that ceiling just fell down. And maybe it fell down right next to where you're sitting. Now for some of you, that experience is, you know, gonna be a bummer. Maybe your desk is a little dirty now. You know, it got in the, in the way of, of what you were doing. It was an inconvenience, but you were able to continue on and with your day and not think anything of it. Others of you, you know, it happened. You're listening to this amazing presentation, but you're really kind of distracted by that thing that ha just happened and you kind of can't let it go. But, you know, you're still, you're still focused and, and you're okay. Others of you, maybe, you know, it's a real trigger. And that event, you know, big or small to some is huge to you and you're experiencing it as, as a really significant event, maybe so, so much so that you have to like stop listening to us talking here today, or you know it comes up later, you, know, you, you dream about it, you're thinking about it tomorrow, those kind of things. I, I like that analogy and, um, because I really feel like that highlights how there is so many dimensions of trauma and that when we're working with somebody and we're hearing about an event, it's really important that we don't decide for them the impact of that experience, no matter what it is. And that it's really important that we spend time really understanding the impact on that person, thinking about things like, you know, if it's, if it's a young child, so what's their temperament like? You know, how are they, how are they kind of interpreting what's happened? And then again, going back to what Melina said about the importance of that caregiver child relationship, How's the caregiver doing with what happened? What's maybe their experience with this same uh, event? What's their experience with being able to provide safety and security for the child, um, either during, uh, you know, right after the experience or, or at any point, uh, a caregiver relationship. We talk about um, ghosts in the nursery. So understanding, you know, maybe what happened to the, the caregiver and how they're interpreting what's happening to their child is really important. So lots of questions, and we'll talk a little bit about some, some ways that you can make sure that you're uh, asking questions and bringing this conversation up whenever something is presenting itself to you, even if it's not trauma overtly, that you're, you're bringing that into the conversation. Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback on that too, because in doing intakes of families, you know, with children who have, you know, behavioral, emotional, developmental concerns, you know, I, I always ask, families, you know, have there been any kind of changes at all in the past, you know, year? Um, you know, did you move houses? Did you, you know, go back to work, have a baby, you know, just things that maybe are part, part of regular everyday life that 
you might expect a child to adjust to really well. And a parent might say, oh, well, you know, I did go back to work, but the child will be able to stay home and, you know, a family member is coming to watch them or they really like their daycare or something like that. You know, those are still things that, you know, we can take that and say, okay, well, that's seems like they might be adjusting well, but that's a piece of information that, you know, we can consider as, you know, maybe typically a child would uh, cope with this pretty easily, but every child is different. Every child's temperament, personality is different. And so I think those are just you know, good questions to ask in assessment. Absolutely. And I would just add, they're important questions to ask no matter who is in front of you, no matter their socioeconomic status, no matter what the presenting issue is. We're asking that question to every single person who comes through our door. About 63% of Californians have experienced at least one adverse childhood experience. And I'm sure most of you in this audience have heard of those adverse childhood experiences, the ACEs, um, and, and how critical it is to pay attention to them and to be asking about them in your work. No one is a bigger champion of bringing this into the conversation than our first Surgeon General, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, she's pictured here. If you want a good TED talk um, about adverse childhood experiences and the importance of incorporating the conversation of trauma into medical practice and behavioral health practices, um, listen, to, listen to her TED talk, it's, it's very good. Um, when she was the first Surgeon General back in 2019, she led an initiative to make sure that we were talking about toxic stress, talking about trauma. Her goal was to reduce the rate of toxic stress by half. And what she did, the way she did that was she uh, worked with, uh, well, with our governor and with ACEs Aware, which was the first organization to really champion a tool that the state of California created uh, and, and, and encouraged people to use to ask about trauma. And the way they encouraged it was they provided training. So in order to use this this tool, you have to get certified. You have to go through a training, um, but then you can use it and um, you get paid for using it uh, with families who have Medi-Cal. They pay for, they pay $29 for each, uh, each time the measure is used. And this is a really important and pretty easy way of asking about adverse childhood experiences. Keep in mind, we're asking about events here, situations like the ones you guys listed in the chat. Um, this ACEs Aware uh, website has a lot of information about just in, in addition to the training about other uh, resources that are available. So I do recommend looking at, at that website if you want to learn more, if you want to want to see the tool that's there. Go to the next slide. Because this is this is the, the tool that Dr. Uh, Nadine Burke Harris uh, helped bring about. It's called the PEARLS, the Pediatric Adverse Childhood Experiences and Related Life Event Screener, or the PEARLS. And really what this is, is it's a two-page tool that has the original adverse childhood experiences, those questions that talked about, uh, about traumatic events. So childhood abuse, uh, or excuse me, childhood physical abuse, sexual abuse, and neglect. And that's on page one. And then page two is some other um, uh, other uh, factors that could that that are known to um, cause stress and, and traumatic reactions, and they're they're particularly topical, I think, in today's world. So I'm really glad that those were added onto the original ACE questions, and those are things like discrimination, uh, neighborhood violence, and also uh, resource care or foster placement. Um, so again, this is a tool that we use in our practice with every single patient. Um, what's nice about it uh, is that originally, and those that are familiar with the ACE surveys and, and how those were, were used, originally this was done and actually started here in San Diego by Dr. Vincent Felitti uh, in the 1990s, and he was using it with adults and asking them retrospectively about their childhood, and, and that's how the tool began. Um, since then, it's really changed a lot, and we've started asking questions when children are younger. So there's a version that you can use with birth to age 11, and then another uh, version, another version for age 12 to 19. Um, and that's, I think, really important. And you know, again, going back to little Jimmy, 
we already know, thinking about some of the things, the prenatal exposure, the changes in placement, the exposure to domestic violence, um, he's already had a number of adverse childhood experiences that we know equate to poor outcomes later in life. And we see that when he was an adult and incarcerated with, with really um, a lot of uh, kind of things stacked against him. So if we could use this back when he was a baby, um, the hope is not that we can ever eradicate his adverse childhood experiences, but we can certainly mitigate them. We can certainly put a lot in place to help, and we're going to be talking more about those protective factors and the things that that we can do to make a difference and really change the trajectory of a child's life. And hopefully, someone like Jimmy, had we been asking those questions, what is his ACE score? What is his Pearl score? Um, when he was 10 months old, it might have been a very different outcome for him. And just one more plug for the Pearls, it is available in 17 different languages currently. So I think that also speaks to the commitment to bringing this to as many people as possible. Now the pearls, as, as we've been, been sharing, is uh, something that is used to capture events and it doesn't really capture symptoms. So there are some other tools and I know some questions were sent in about what are some good tools to use. Uh, so these are, are different ones that, that we've used that um, they're evidence-based, evidence-informed measures that help capture symptoms. So you, you have this event that happened and, and maybe there's an ACE of one, but that one has created a lot of symptoms. I think that's really important too. The number doesn't always tell the tale. So sometimes it's about really looking at those symptoms. What is the reaction, the subjective reaction that the person has had? And so using a measure like this can really also help in recognizing how a child may be presenting. And the trauma symptom checklist for young children, the TSCYC is the one that Melina and I use for our littlest uh, ones because it is uh, something that's normed on children as young as age three. So that does give you some nice profiles. So, and we're gonna definitely talk more about this, but the, it's so important to be thinking about the impact of trauma on when a child's presenting and that we're always bringing that into the conversation. Um, I do a lot of work with children who have neurodevelopmental disorders, so autism, ADHD, and other, other um, issues there. And I'm still always first and foremost asking about trauma, as Melina said, we're always asking that question. And I think that's really important. I can remember a, a case of a child that I was seeing, and he'd actually been seen by another provider who their role, their lens, was just to look at his developmental disability. And so he came out of that assessment with an autism diagnosis. And I did not have that same impression. And when we looked at the timing of that previous assessment, something that was brought to light that really hadn't been part of the conversation in that initial assessment was during that time that he was assessed, there was considerable domestic violence going on in his home. And so I think that's really important that that trauma lens, that trauma-informed approach to looking at what how a child is presenting is, is just super important. And that we're always thinking about that, whether it's when we're meeting a child or you know, an ongoing relationships when you're making plans, very, very important. And then of course, also not just thinking about the impact on the child, but like, what's my role? You know, what can I do to really um, impact things and hopefully change things in a more positive way? Again, we can't erase trauma, we can't erase adverse childhood experiences, but there's a lot we can do to, to course correct. Yeah, and kind of just to add on to that too, is at least in Megan and my role here, we do assessments. And so, you know, that's a huge responsibility and, um, you know, an, an impactful experience. And also, you know, the decisions that we make in our assessments are often lifelong things that you know maybe stay with the child lifelong and so I think just going into these assessments with this kind of mindset thinking you know is one is this the right time to be doing an assessment um, given all everything else that is going on in a child's life and that they're adjusting to and two you know maybe we are assessing but maybe we want to reassess again in the future to see what else you know how else this child's presentation might look like in six months to a year from now. And so I think that is a huge piece of being trauma informed and just you know considering how trauma might be affecting the presentation of a child at that moment in time. Um, so 
So how is early childhood trauma unique? Um, of course, you know, we know that trauma can wreak havoc on our nervous systems, on our overall functioning at any age, um, but what makes it more impactful in early childhood? Um, I think what's notable about the early childhood period is that uh, by age three, a child's brain has reached about 80% of its adult volume um, and neuroplasticity. So kind of the way children are able to make connections to things, um, you know, that is the strongest during early childhood. And so this is a really critical period of development. I'm sure you hear that term a lot. Um, but in, in terms of, you know, brain development, um, it's, Know, vital that a child has you know positive experiences, positive relationships, um, that their needs are being met in early childhood to avoid uh, these more kind of long-term physiological effects. Um, um, and so some of these you know impacts of early childhood trauma is that you know especially as compared to maybe an adult experiencing trauma experiencing trauma is that there's this um, there you know, sensory processing systems can be thrown all out of whack when they experience trauma. So maybe certain visual stimuli can activate a stress response or maybe loud noises or if somebody's, you know, just swift movements from another person or touch, um, those things can be associated with a traumatic experience. So, um, you know, it can be related to a specific event or even just high stress that a, a a young child has experienced. Um, and even if that trauma is not experienced directly by the child. So for example, if a child has maybe witnessed um, domestic violence in the home, you know, maybe they were in a different room or, um, you know, maybe they were just not, they were not involved in the, the incident, but um, the fact that, you know, they've heard this experience, you know, that can disrupt their sensory processing experiences long-term. Um, and so, you know, children are also less able to anticipate danger or know how to keep themselves safe. And so, uh, one, this may make them more susceptible to trauma. And also, if they have experienced trauma, you know, that certain experiences um, create certain cognitions in their head of what maybe they think is normal or what expectations are, uh, you know. One example is that, you know, child, young children have kind of a different perception of reality than we do. And, you know, due to their immature kind of cognition. Um, and so they might associate that, you know, I spilled my milk and then mom and dad got in a fight. That's my fault. And when I make a mistake, these bad things might happen. And so that's just one example of a cognition that, you know, we know is distorted to us as adults, but for a young child, that makes sense to them. And so, you know, we want to consider how this kind of sets up their whole way of thinking in other situations. And maybe that might help us understand how a young child is acting in the daycare setting, or maybe is having difficulty making friends, or seems just really shy or antisocial. You know, these are just things to consider um, and kind of how trauma might be influencing a child's uh, presentation in other settings. Um, the other thing is that young children can't express how they're feeling, um, what they need. And so sometimes that might lead to them acting out in different ways to communicate that. Um, and it might not be communicated in an appropriate manner or even an effective manner um, to get their needs met, but you know, that they're doing communicating in the way that they can. Um, the other, uh, Another way that early childhood trauma is unique is that um, it impacts the development of the brain. Um, I did have a picture here and I guess it didn't show up, but um, kind of the picture that I wanted to add in here was, you know, a picture of an, a three-year-old's brain that had not experienced trauma and a three-year-old's brain who had. And the um, amount of gray matter in, in each child's brain was very different. And so really what that's saying is that um, their kind of capacity for functioning, you know, is higher in, indiv in an individual who has not experienced 
such trauma. And you can see it in brain scans. It's not just something that we're assuming based on behavior, but uh, something that has been proven uh, through research. Um, and so, um, you know, some other kind of examples of the ways that trauma can exp can affect the body and, you know, physiological systems is um, it can lead to dysregulation in the HPA axis, which is our body's stress response system. So it can, you know, be make it more sensitive so that individuals might be more um, prone to acting out and getting really worked up when maybe there's not actually a stress being present. Um, it can also impact the activity of neurotransmitters in the brain. Um, for example, you know, maybe there's decreased serotonin as a result of that, or too much epinephrine or adrenaline um, that impacts a child's you know, functioning. Um, and um, early childhood trauma has also been associated with a reduced size of the brain cortex, which um, is responsible for various really significant brain functions like memory, attention, visual processing, sensory processing, speech, motor planning. Um, I, I'm sure, I don't know if some of those things sound familiar as things that we are assessing for when children come to us. I know for probably me and Megan um, and doing early childhood assessments, I am almost always looking at speech I'm almost always assessing some motor skills. Um, sensory processing is a huge one and attention. And so, you know, it's very clear that it's trauma can be really embedded in the way that a whole child, you know, is functioning in their environment. Um, and so it's really important, of course, that we're understanding how trauma might show up in a in early childhood um, and how that might impact the way that we're perceiving different behaviors or uh, developmental concerns. Um, and then lastly, you know, this is not an exhaustive list, but lastly on the slide, um, children are dependent on their parents and their caregivers to keep them safe, to help them regulate. You know, we know that children need co-regulation to be able to learn how to regulate their own bodies. Um, and this goes back to that quote that I just recently shared that there's no such thing as an infant. There's always somebody else. Um, a, infant and a baby, a child needs somebody else to help them um, process these big emotions, big events. Um, and so, you know, this leaves us with, instead of asking, you know, what's wrong with this child, I encourage you to shift your thinking to what happened to this child. And if I could, Melina, too, just to share a quick uh, story about that. So, uh, in one of the programs that I'm a part of, we have care coordination, which is a really lucky service if you have it. Um, and one of the care coordinators that was part of the team, just this very warm individual, just all about the babies, loved uh, interacting with them and would go on home visits oftentimes and went to this one home with this cute little baby, um, it's about six months old. And every time she leaned into just, you know, Play and, and talk to the baby, the baby would just scream. And it was very upsetting for everybody. And um, the, the care coordinator couldn't figure out what was happening. And um, anyway, kind of over time, and I think this speaks to how important it is when you see a baby communicating in the way that babies do, one of which is crying like she did, um, really trying to understand what that what function that behavior is serving and you know what is she trying to say and what we kind of realized over time was that the care coordinator her physical presentation really looked a lot like very visibly a lot like um, the um, person who had, um, had physically abused this baby and you know same, same kind of head hair uh, color and shape she had glasses so what the care coordinator did in response to that was really kind of changed her appearance whenever she was around the baby. So she pulled her hair back, took off her glasses, and the baby stopped crying. So that was, I think, a really great example of you know, sticking with something, understanding it, and then changing our course to help the child who can't tell us any more than they're already doing. Being trauma-informed. That's right. And I think we're trying to show that image of the brain. Um, it's Bruce Perry's work. If you need it, um, we can get that information to you. But it is a really 
I think, kind of remarkable uh, picture of how different a brain that has extreme neglect can look, picture very small, to one that has not had that impact and, and the, just the size difference. It really does impact all areas of functioning, including brain growth and development. Right, and so um, kind of transitioning to back to that question of what happened to you, um, you know, maybe by a show of, you know, a reaction, a thumbs up or, you know, whatever reaction you want to share, but um, who's heard of this book, what happened to you or heard of it or read this book? Thumbs up and hearts. Okay, I see a lot, that's great. Um, Awesome. Okay. Well, this book was written by renowned psychiatrist Bruce, Bruce Perry um, and Oprah Winfrey, who I'm sure most, if not all of us know. Um, and so this book is really a dialogue between the two of them where Oprah discusses some of her early childhood trauma. Um, and they have this kind of back and forth discussion about how these experiences rewire the brain and the body um, and how a lot of you know, behavioral difficulties or relational problems and things that individuals experience even as adults really stem from what happened to them in their childhood or you know, early experiences. And so, you know, as it's you know, insinuated by the title, um, this book is really trying to bring understanding to, you know, a lot of these behaviors are things that even I was just talking about, you know, responses to different visual stimuli or noises or um, having difficulty with attention or memory or speech, these things where I might think of an individual and thinking like, why are they this way? Or, you know, why are they acting this way? Or they're being so difficult and, um, or, you know, I can't figure them out um, and it, or it's hard to connect with them. Um, you know, there's more to it than just, you know, uh, a behavioral problem or uh, a choice to be difficult, you know, for lack of a better word. Um, and so, um, you know, one thing that I wanted to really touch on as um, kind of an excerpt from this book or something that we pulled from this is that um, the diagram to the right here, um, I know it seems a little complicated, but I'm, I'm going to you know, go over it. Um, uh, it, it, so this diagram depicts the impact of early adversity and then the mediation of protective relationships in the first two months of life. So whether that's a mother who's there, you know, tending to a baby's needs, it could be a grandmother, but any caregiver that is providing consistent care and meeting the basic needs of, of a baby in their first two months of life, that could be any one of those individuals. Um, and so what this is saying that, you know, in the first, if in the first two months of life, a child experienced high adversity and minimal relational buffering. So for example, they lived in a lot of dysfunction, their needs weren't being met. It's a child who maybe is exposed to domestic violence or neglect, um, you know, just not having basic needs met. Um, and they don't have a close relationship or a secure attachment with a caregiver. Um, but after those for two, first two months of life, they spent 12 years it with, you know, in a healthier environment and having their needs met, they still had worse outcomes than children who had low adversity. So we're having their needs met, um, had, you know, good attachment in their first two months of life but spent the next 12 years with a lot of dysfunction and stress and adversity. I think that is a kind of wild you know, statement or finding, you know, the just just kind of sit with that, you know. Yeah, the first child, two months of life, whoa. <laughs> yeah. So a child who only has, who has two months of really bad experiences and 12 years of really good experiences, just to really simplify this does worse than the child with almost 12 years of bad experiences, but two months of really good experiences. So we really can't wait, can we? Like we've got to do things immediately. Yeah, and this, I mean, this really speaks to the timing of these experiences and just how critical this period of development is in, in infancy. Um, and so, you know, I think it, it might 
sound discouraging and it, you know, might seem like, oh, this child is doomed, you know, we're, what can we do? You know, their first two months were so terrible. And, um, but that, I don't, I don't want to leave you with that. <laughs> um, just because, you know, uh, a child had those first two months of life riddled with adversity. Um, I think it just highlights the significance of prevention and just how impactful we can be in our work um, and really signals to us as providers that, you know, we need to be even asking questions, even if we're not, even if we're seeing a child way past their first two months, they're five years old at this point, we still want to be asking about that because we know how impactful that critical period of development is. Um, and I, it's also kind of a perfect example of why we need you know, developmentally informed and trauma aware systems, whether that be in you know our medical or clinical kind of settings, educational settings. Um, I saw a lot of individuals who in the chat who seemed like they were working for community organizations, um, you know, assisting families, parents, children. So um, yeah, I just encourage you to kind of consider this and you know of you know how important this this the relationships are um and specifically in that first two months. And I think just to add to that too, you know, we often hear comments like, oh well, yeah, that happened, but he was a baby and he was asleep. You know, that sort of kind of thinking that they're protected by that. And actually this is suggesting quite the opposite, that they're not. And that we really need to be concerned about that from, from the beginning, from the start when they're brand new. Yeah. And also, so in, in this image too is, um, I know I'm talking about the first two months of life, but this image also applies to all, all ages, just in general, that when there's high adversity, but really high relational health, so really high support systems and close you know, connectedness with another person, um, that their developmental risk um, is lower. But if they have you know, low adversity and um, low relational health, then they still, you know, might be at higher risk for developmental problems. So I'm just really highlighting the importance of this relational health and how it can really um, mediate the impacts of adversity. And if you were working with Jimmy at 10 months and you had the information that he'd already been in three Placements, so three different primary caregivers taking care of him, right? That disruption had already happened. And so we, we know enough to know that he's going to need our help. Even if he's not showing any symptoms per se, he's at high, high risk. And so to talk about some more effects of trauma exposure, um, these include neurological and biological effects, some of which sharing about um, in terms of you know, regulatory rhythms, the structure of the brain, um, the functioning of the brain um, being impacted. There could be problems with movement um, and sensation, um, somatic symptoms like you know, increased stomach aches or headaches or um, feeling fatigued, things like that, um, and also increased medical problems. We know that um, adverse childhood experiences put individuals at higher risk of health problems. Um, and so, you know, when we talk about to the challenges with self-regulation, um, you know, I think a lot of us have had experiences with young children who are really sensitive to becoming dysregulated and it might not take much to really kind of trigger them. Um, and, you know, that might lead to them acting out for attention, um, or really not knowing how, what to do with, you know, the feelings in their body and the sensory experiences that they're having. Um, and so, you know, all that to say, you know, trauma can impact that. Um, and again, young children don't necessarily have the words to be able to express how they're feeling. Um, and I think too, a lot of children, you know, this, this has to do with parents as well. Um, and how are we helping parents to be able to talk with their children in a kind of developmentally appropriate ways about feelings and the importance of helping a child co-regulate. I know in my practice, um, I see a lot of parents who, you know, well, kids are referred to me who have some kind of behavioral, emotional, or developmental concerns. A lot of times when they come to me, the parent is 
you know, I might be one of the first individuals that the parent has interacted with. And it is often really clear to me that the parent is feeling overwhelmed and, you know, stressed because this child has a lot of needs that the parent is just unsure of how to meet because it's challenging. And so, you know, when parents don't really know how to help their child regulate, maybe what they uh, their first instinct to do is to maybe get loud or put a very firm, loud boundary down with the child. A lot of times that increases, you know, their distress and um, it's not helping them to regulate. So I don't, you know, I, I wonder if a lot of parents even, you know, know kind of how that's impacting their child or um, what they could do differently. Um, and I also think, of course, stress impacts their ability to do that in the first place. So, um, and then um, when it comes to attachment, uh, there are a few different styles of attachment, um, as I'm sure a lot of us know. So there's, you know, secure, like anxious, avoidant, and disorganized attachment. Um, and that disorganized attachment style is really indicative of trauma. Um, and so, you know, of course, a child's maybe sometimes getting their needs met or not getting their needs met, or maybe there's kind of volatility in, in the parent's emotions or in their reactions to a child crying, um, that can really disrupt that attachment between the parent and the child. Uh, and it also influences kind of an, a child's internal working model of, kind of how they perceive the world, how they perceive situations, how they perceive relationships with other people. Um, and so, you know, maybe one example of that is, you know, um, you know, when I cry or, you know, maybe, maybe an example is that people are bad. That might be an internal working model that I have understood that, you know, people hurt me, um, or maybe bad things happen. Um, then maybe an individual has a harder time connecting to other kids at school, other adults. Um, and that might lead to behavioral difficulties in those settings. So, just one example of maybe how um, it, an insecure attachment could lead to you know, ways that a child perceives the world. Um, and then in regards to developmental effects, um, we might see regression of skills um, or we might see fears that are out of proportion to the situation or the developmental stage that a child is at. Um, and I wanted to give an example of um, a child. I just did an intake with this family two days ago, and um, there's concerns for autism. That's why this child is referred to me, and this child's 24 months old. Um, but there's also a history of trauma um, and involving the child witnessing domestic violence for several months throughout their first two years of life. Um, and um, so the child know is delayed in their speech and um, when I asked about kind of developmental history and um, the development of speech the parent had said that um, or I had asked if there was any changes in their skills if they had skills and then maybe they seemed like they lost them and the parent said yes actually um, that you know the child had been babbling and had been using some words and some short phrases and um, seemed a bit happier and then around the time that you know this the domestic violence had increased in the home and the relationship was kind of coming to a head that he seemed to stop talking and that he seemed like he was much more attached to the mom and just a bit more anxious, um, but had really just become more quiet overall, was not speaking at all. Um, and then, you know, now um, the, the mom and the child are in a different environment um, and there's some more stability there and the child is picking up more of these skills. And so I thought that was just a really interesting and relevant example of how we might see regression in skills surrounding really stressful life events, experiences. And so, uh, yeah, it's super important to consider when assessing for developmental and emotional disorders in childhood. And I see in the chat that Rosalia mentioned that earlier about just, you know, kind of understanding why a child might become silent um, you know, they have, they present with speech delay, but you don't take the time to really understand what the context is, what maybe had gone on to ask those questions about stress and, and trauma uh, exposure. You may be missing an, an understanding about what's needed. 
exactly. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for adding that chat. Right. Um, so, you know, trauma, um, just to continue on with a little, some more effects of trauma exposure, um, it can impact the child's ability to pick up on parental cues and might impact a child's own ability to cue their parents as to what their needs are, um, including for social relatedness. That might mean that maybe they're not like babbling, you know, as, a, as an infant, you know, that's how they might get their ch their parents' attention by making sounds or maybe kicking their legs or um, making eye contact, cooing, things like that, smiling at their parent. And so those are some cues that might be more um, inconsistent uh, with the child. If, you know, they might not be giving those cues and the parent might also not be picking up on those as well. Um, and there could just be, you know, different avoidant patterns of social interaction. Um, you know, in, in young children, there might be difficulties with using pro-social skills, like, you know, using their words or um, not being as impulsive uh, when interacting with other children. Um, it might also include some sibling aggression. Uh, and in terms of behavioral control, um, some of those kind of um, effects that I was talking about in terms of brain development can also impact you know, behavior in terms of poor impulse control, um, which might lead to some injurious behavior or self-destructive kind of behavior and aggression. Um, and again, can also impact cognition. So difficulty focusing on and completing tasks or planning for and anticipating future events. Uh, when you, when you read that line even, what comes to mind? When you see, oh, parent is having concerns that they can't focus and complete tasks, it's having difficulty planning. What, what is the first thing that comes to your mind <laughs> that you might be assessing for? Oh, yeah, ADHD. <laughs> Yeah, well, even right, exactly. good point. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And so before jumping to, oh, this is purely developmental, we also want to take into consideration how the mental health is impacting the, the developmental presentation. Um, and then for those that are you know, in school, they, you might see some difficulties with learning um, and then problems with language development. And um, so something that I just want to, I guess, kind of summarize with all these things is that all behaviors are some form of communication, whether it is a conscious communication by a child or kind of an, an unsubconscious kind of communication. Um, in early childhood, you know, when we know that children are having trouble expressing themselves verbally or maybe do not have those developmental skills quite yet, um, we're interpreting behavior as telling us something. It's not just a problem, but it's communicating something to us. And I think when we shift our perspectives that way, um, it helps us as providers, you know, one, to maybe have some patience when a child is really dysregulated in our office, um, but also to help us really understand the child better. Okay, and um, some more symptoms and behaviors that might be associated with this exposure, exposure to trauma. Um, of course, this is not an exhaustive list, but um, just some things to think about. And, um, you know, I, I think too, something to um, consider is kind of the context in which these behaviors are occurring. So if we already know that maybe there's been a big stressor in the family's life, and now you're seeing problems with toileting, might not just, just be um, an adaptive delay, but might be more communication of you know, discomfort, stress, um, need for more parent involvement in, in daily routines. Um, and so we, and also, you know, not only the context that these behaviors are occurring in, but we also wanna think about the intensity and the frequency of these behaviors um, and when it happens. So, you know, one example could be, uh, you know, a child just started sucking their thumb and it might seem out of the norm or might not seem out of the norm for a two-year-old to be sucking their thumb. But if we see that it began um, right after, you know, the grandma died, 
who was a big part of the child's life, um, we might think of it a bit differently um, as meaning something rather than just you know, a behavior that happened to start when they were two. You know, it might be a coping strategy for that child. And so um, a lot of what we're looking out for when we're assessing early childhood mental health is a change in behavior from the child's baseline. Um, not just that these things are occurring, but that they are, maybe are new behaviors or it's different from what is typical for that child. Okay. So when we're thinking about trauma, one thing that is really important is just the complexity. And as we've been talking about, you know, what could this be? It gets often really hard. And while we're encouraging you to always have trauma on your mind when you're working with, with somebody who's got things going on that you're always bringing that to the forefront, it is, it is tricky. And there's so much overlap between the different things that children present with. This video is one of my favorites. I don't know how many of you have seen it, but it's um, an American psychologist, uh, at Dr. Edward Tronick of Harvard. And um, he does a wonderful job of, I think, showing the effects of, of when that primary caregiver withholds interacti interaction and engagement and what that looks like. And we'll let you look at, we'll let you watch it and then talk a little bit. And I will say it is a little hard to watch um, the baby, but here we go. Babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. And the spill phase experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. And she gives a greeting to the baby. The baby gives a greeting back to her. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? Oh, no. She makes that screechy oh. sound right. at the mother. Like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in these two minutes, when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions. They turn away. They feel the stress of it. They actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. <laughs> It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good is no reparation, and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. Nicole in the chat said, wow, I agree. That one just gets me every time. I mean, you know, it's only two minutes. Imagine if that was this child's experience ongoing and what that could look like if they were to present in front of you during that period where she wasn't getting her needs met. Um, and, and, you know, it makes us think about a lot of different, 
disorders, you know, childhood disorders. Um, we're going to talk more about that, that overlap, but uh, one for sure that that one brings up for me is, is autism spectrum disorder. You know, we saw the baby having a lot of really good social communication skills at the beginning, but then just that complete shutdown and all she could do was just become dysregulated and disengaged and withdrawn in, just, in such a short amount of time. So pretty profound, I think. Um, this next slide is as we talk about, you know, how do you assess infant mental health? How do we how do we understand what's happening? And of course, this is what we've been talking about the whole time, but it's not so easy to understand, I think, for a lot of people. Um, I was back east uh, visiting my husband's family and my brother-in-law uh, was asking me about what I do. And I said that I work with uh, I do work with young children and, and mental health and in, in, in infants and toddlers. And he said, well, how do you do that? They're so little. And I, my response was, well, we look at the things that babies do best. They eat, they sleep, and they poop. And when you work with this age group, and Melina and I are often talking about poop. <laughs> and that's just an important part of the conversation because when something isn't going right, when they're constipated or they have diarrhea, then something's not right. Um, when their sleep is disturbed, they either have difficulties with sleep onset or sleep disturbance. They're restless when they sleep. They're eating too much. We know a lot about that from the ACE study about overeating uh, when there's trauma or undereating um, due, to, due to mood disturbance and, and other things. Those are all ways that without the baby telling us with words that we can begin to know that something's not right. Now, of course, with any of these, we're always going to start with looking at any kind of medical reason for something not being right. But once we've ruled that out, we're gonna pay attention because those things should be happening as we would expect. And when they don't, we need to pause. Um, somebody, Annabelle in the chat um, asked, how do you balance the piece about changes from baseline being potential trauma symptoms with also knowing that kids do change a lot so quickly during early childhood? Yeah, really good. I, I guess I can take a stab at answering yeah. this is that, you know, I think a lot of it is um, paying attention to the signs that children are displaying. And so just because a kid started sucking their thumb, you know, maybe we won't think of that as a change from baseline. Um, but if there are problematic behaviors and there's maybe this context where there's some concerns about possible trauma, um, that's when we want to really be paying attention to early childhood mental health. And um, I think, you know, the kind of preventative strategies and things that we might make for a child who's having behavioral difficulties um, might be really similar, or, you know, we can incorporate a bit about, uh, you know, attachment and things like that with psycho psychoeducation with parents or with therapeutic interventions that we're doing, because ultimately, I think, you know, in early childhood attachment, um, development, behavior, mental health, all of that is so closely intertwined that, you know, when there is a, a problem happening, you know, the intervention might be kind of similar. So, so I don't know if you want to answer or add anything else to that, Megan. I would just add, I think that you know, it's very important. We talk a lot about trauma-informed practice, but it's also very important to have developmentally informed practice. So just as you're mentioning, we have to really understand what is kind of a typical trajectory. Change does happen pretty rapidly. I mean, speech is a great example. You know, there's often a, a rapid shift in, in speech progression in a young child. And so understanding that is going to be really important and part of our job. I think also looking at the degree of interference um, and when it's happening is going to be real important. Yeah. I also thought of maybe adding one more thing is that, you know, when you think about kind of what I was saying and there could maybe regressions in certain skills when a child has experienced trauma, we also see regressions in certain skills, oftentimes with children who have autism. And so, you know, piecing that apart can be challenging, um, but we're also uh, putting this into context of where the child again, developmental level is, and not just where their age is, but where their specific developmental level is. And, you know, we do cognitive assessments on babies all the time. And, um, you know, maybe you have some kind of estimate of that based on screeners that you give for children. But if I ha assess a child and their cognitive level is more similar, say they're two years old, but their cognitive level is more similar to somebody who is nine months old, 
then I might, you know, reframe kind of where I'm thinking that their skills should be at. You know, if they're not playing, you know, with pretend to play yet at two years old, I might not be, um, you know, just thinking trauma. I might be thinking, you know, they're behind developmentally. That makes sense. Okay. So we could do a whole presentation and we actually have on some of these discrete uh, diagnoses and how they relate and how they are similar and different from trauma. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about trauma because we, we really feel strongly that that's an important place to start. After you've ruled out any medical issues, you're always asking about trauma. And then you're looking at the possibility of another neuro developmental disorder or developmental delay. Um, ADHD is one of those uh, disorders that overlaps oftentimes with trauma. And again, it's kind of hard, you know, we, we did this Venn diagram where we showed some discrete symptoms. I'm not gonna read the whole list. You guys will definitely get copies of this PowerPoint, but there, there are a lot of things that overlap. And so it's so important to number one, say, okay, well, when I'm talking about ADHD, I'm talking about a persistent pattern of inattention and hyperactivity and impulsivity that is interfering in that child's life, their relationships, their learning. It's, it's a big deal. It's more than we'd expect because if you think about young kids, you know, oftentimes if they're doing it right, they're living large, they're, they're busy, they're doing stuff, they're impulsive. So, you know, when is it kind of, crossing that threshold of a concern. That's going to be something to think about. But also, what else could it be? And so things like them being easily distracted, not listening, being disorganized. Remember, Melina was talking about that attachment, that disorganized attachment style that could be uh, indicative of a trauma reaction. Uh, restlessness, difficulty sleeping, all of those things may make us think about ADHD, but also should make us think about trauma. Um, I can remember uh, one time, and this speaks to how important it is with every single family that we're giving that a survey, that PEARLS uh, measure. Be, uh, I was working with a family, and um, it was a mom and, and a little boy, a four-year-old, and everything that she was telling me, and I did a thorough history taking, spent a couple hours doing uh, standardized testing with this child, everything, all signs were pointing to ADHD. She filled out the PEARLS, and then we took a break. And I looked at her responses and she had checked off the item where it talked about domestic violence. So I went back and asked her about it. Well, she hadn't shared, but within the last six months, the father actually had left the home and come back after um, a pretty significant uh, altercation uh, where he had uh, been violent towards the mother and the older brother had actually come in and and inter inter interfered with this situation. The police were called, and this little four-year-old was there the whole time. So that was that was significant to me, and made me grateful for the tool, um, and grateful for the fact that I had moved into the conversation because it completely changed my treatment recommendations. Instead of launching into what I thought was going to be an ADHD diagnosis, I shifted, and we really uh, focused the treatment plan on more uh, trauma-informed uh, therapy. For the family. And, you know, this mom really wasn't trying to withhold information. I just really hadn't asked her as directly as I think that tool allowed, or for whatever reason, it just hadn't come into the conversation. Um, and so I think, well, I like to think I do a good job of, of really making that, you know, inviting that information. Um, it's, it's just so important that we that we, we ask it and we ask it in different ways. Um, and that some, and we recognize that, you know, for whatever reason, a parent may not tell us something or a caregiver may not tell us something in one situation. And so we ask it again in a different way and maybe then we get that result. But um, yeah, a lot of overlap between trauma and ADHD and, and very important for us to, to be thinking about that. Another one, and I think that video really highlights this is the overlap between autism and trauma. This is a, a definite personal passion area for, my, for me and my career. Um, I really um, appreciate the opportunity to look at, and I think Yannan, who's in our audience today, um, we used to get to work with, um, you know, shared this idea of assessment over time. And a lot of times that's what's needed. Um, you have a child presenting and yeah, things look like autism. And if by that, I mean difficulties with social communication, 
for verbal skills, nonverbal skills. You know, they don't have good eye contact. They're not using gestures. They're not integrating their um, their eyes and hands when they're talking. There's no there's not a range of facial expressions. Maybe they have restricted and repetitive behaviors, uh, flapping their hands, they're lining up toys, they're real rigid in, in their play or their thinking. Um, all of those things are things that make us think about autism, but also many of those uh, are things that we see with people who are having a trauma reaction and young kids in particular. I remember one time I was giving this a talk specifically about this area of autism and trauma and I, was, I, I had the, the fortune of getting to do it with a trauma therapist. And we were talking about that topic of regression in skills and just mentioned the word regression in skills. And she immediately said, oh, that's a trauma reaction. And I went, oh, that's an autism spectrum reaction. So that lens is so important. And I think, um, you know, my hope is that I'm really looking at, at both areas every time this question of a neurodevelopmental disorder comes up. I'm, I'm really thinking about, um, you know, what might be coming into play here. And Again, that video with that young child, if we had just seen the second part of that when she was withdrawn, we might have had a very different con conclusion because she certainly had some really wonderful social overtures and really great communication. You saw the joint attention with the mom and, and just how eager she was uh, to engage that mom. Um, so that was a very different beginning than when she wasn't getting her needs met. And I just wanted to add that, you know, I am a very early career psychologist that, you know, I find these assessments to be challenging. And I I think, you know, at their core, they are challenging. And sometimes when I'm, you know, looking at all the symptoms and really trying to piece apart what is what is autism, what what seems like autism and what seems more like trauma, I actually make a Venn diagram just like this when I'm doing my, you know, interpretation of results to to really kind of reflect on well what could be both and um, I think it also helps me to be able to better explain it to parents of you know well this is this might be contributed or attributed to this and this might be attributed to this and these are things that you know might be overlapping here so yeah, just want to normalize that. <laughs> Well, and thank you, Haley. She put we we do another talk um, where we look specific more kind of a deeper dive at autism and trauma and ADHD and trauma. So if you're interested, there's a link to that training as well. Right. Um, so depression. Um, that baby, <laughs> the little boy, and uh, the reason I have these two pictures here. Um, obviously one for little diversity in the slide, but um, I really just wanted to stress too, like how different depression might look in different ages of children, because, um, you know, in babies, it might look very different than what it might look like in, you know, early childhood. And so um, for infants, um, maybe some questions to ask when considering depression um, are, you know, are they, are they able to express a wide range of emotions? You know, maybe if, if they're not, that might be something to be concerned about. Um, you know, if they're really quiet and subdued, um, is it really difficult to get them to engage with you socially? Are they withdrawn, maybe staring into space? Um, sometimes I hear parents who come in and say, you know, I'm asking them how their baby is and, you know, their mood and temperament. And they'll say, they're a really easy baby. They never cry. Um, like, oh, this is how they are all the time. They're really quiet. And um, I think, you know, I, of course, I think that these parents are well-meaning and I think there's just maybe a misperception about maybe what babies should be doing uh, that's developmentally appropriate. And um, so while, yes, it might be nice that they're not crying a lot or, you know, making a lot of no noise and maybe disrupting, um, uh, you know, the quiet. Um, these are things that, you know, are, are concerning. And, you know, we want to make sure that a baby is able to uh, practice kind of developmental skills. So when they are, you know, kind of flat, not making any, any noises, usually not engaging socially, um, maybe seem sad and not having a, a range of facial expressions, those might be indicators that the baby's mental health is, is of concern. Um, and of course, always asking if, you know, this behavior is a change from their usual presentation, um, because also there could be other things, you know, medical reasons going on that could be um, causing them to display this type of presentation. Um, so that's why that last question is really important. 
um, and then in young children um, might look really different. So of course, some of these things, you know, could also be present in young children and could still be indicative of depression, but some differences in how we diagnose depression in ch childhood versus adulthood or adolescence is, um, you know, are, are they irritable, maybe having mood swings, that might be a big indicator that there's some, uh, yeah, some depression going on. Uh, are they having difficulty getting along with peers at school or um, in other social settings? Um, and are they interested in playing with toys and, you know, interacting as expected for their age? Um, and then again, um, I didn't put it on the slide, but again, uh, again, reverting back to, are they sleeping, eating and pooping, all those things, are those things being impacted as well? Um, and in infants, you know, we're not necessarily, or I'm not necessarily giving diagnoses of depression in, in infants, but what that often looks like for me, if I'm seeing this as maybe an adjustment disorder, um, I, I think that's probably most common for me. Um, but, you know, these are definitely indicators that they may be experiencing depression. And Rosalia um, asked if you can see this in a one-month-old. And, you know, it's certainly hard, I think, because they're so new and we don't have any baseline. Um, but absolutely. Um, and in our clinic, we see children, you know, under one month of age at times. There's a tool called the INS2 out of Brown University. Uh, the NICU Network Neurobehavioral Scales, and it looks at things like neurological reflexes and motor development and just some of those very kind of beginning skills. And that is that context developmentally from which we can say, okay, well, here's their chronological age. Where is their developmental age? And then what do we expect? And if things aren't happening the way we'd expect, then again, we'd worry. I think it, it's it's not easy to do it at one month. And certainly we're not making definitive um you know, just, you know, we're not coming to definitive decision making at one month, but I think it's never too early, especially when we think about Bruce Perry's work for those first two months of life, right? Like, and we do not have this, the slide in Spanish on depression, unfortunately, right now, but I'm sure that could be made available, but the, the slides will be available for sure. And so there's anxiety and, you know, depression and anxiety are two of the most common um, childhood mental or mental disorders in childhood or adulthood. And so um, in babies, this might look like, you know, some kind of questions to ask are, uh, are they more irritable than usual? Um, are they really difficult to console? Um, are they having difficulty sleeping? Are they really easily startled by either you walking past? Um, I've heard that from parents of some children who maybe, you know, um, like have experience in trauma or maybe you're in resource care and there's not a lot of clarity on what their early life experiences were like. But I've heard a lot of parents talk about that in their in, in infants that, you know, it's, it's really interesting. I might just walk by and they weren't expecting that or I might reach over them to get something and they just startle like this. And so that's something to keep an eye out for. Um, and then how do they do when it's time to separate? You know, um, whether that's going with another caregiver to daycare, whether you, when you leave the room, um, what is their behavior like? And again, is it a behavior change from their normal presentation and temperament? And then in young children, um, you know, some things that we might see is, you know, if they're able to maybe verbally express worries about things, or even in early childhood, you, you can tell when a child is worrying about something, even without them being able to verbally express it, their body language might tell something, or they might be avoidant of certain situations or um, things that, you know, make them nervous. Um, you know, if they have any specific fears, um, do they have to do things in the right order or position? again, that is a symptom that could be overlapping with something like autism. Um, does your child ask for reassurance when it doesn't seem necessary? Um, and then, you know, how do they do when it's time to separate whether even if it's to go to something fun um, that you think that your child might be excited about, but they're still having difficulty for that, that you know, might bring up concern for anxiety. And again, it's important to consider the, the frequency and the intensity of these things because, you know, it's pretty typical for a three-year-old to maybe be afraid of the dark, but if this is really 
you know, and again, there's, I think that's a really, maybe not the best example, because I think a lot of three-year-olds might have difficulty staying in their beds. And there's a lot of factors that influence that. But um, all that to say is that they're, you know, having fears and worries is really age appropriate in young children, but the extent to how much, you know, they're spending time worrying about that and how it's impacting their functioning and the family's functioning, I think is what really um, is kind of significant or telling for you know, whether this is, is anxiety or not. Yeah, um, I always, my, my like thing I always say to myself yeah, is frequency and intensity, you know, how much is it happening? How much is it interfering? Yeah. And I, I actually wanted to share um, kind of an anecdote of a, of a child that I was working with, because I think it's a really good example of, you know, what this looks like in a, in a baby. Um, just a, a month or so ago, I did an evaluation of a 15 month old who was in resource care. He was in the process of reunification with his parents, um, but he was in resource care because he had experienced a traumatic head injury that was assumed to be non-accidental when he was three months old. Um, there are also some other stressors at the family of being recent immigrants and, um, you know, not having a ton of supports here in, in San Diego. And um, so anyway, this child was referred to me. There was, you know, just some, some early concerns for autism, but overall developmental concerns as well. And so um, in the referral, there was you know, information from the resource parent and also from the, the bio parents. And there was very, very conflicting information from both settings and in that the foster, the resource parent was saying that, you know, well, he's able to, he does play with toys, he can walk, um, you know, he interacts with me, he laughs, all this. But the bio parents were saying when he comes to visits with us and, and he was spending two full days a week with them. so. Still, they're spending a lot of time with him, but they were saying when he comes with us, it's like all he wants to do is sleep. Um, he doesn't have show. He has a flat affect. Um, it doesn't seem like he is interested in any toys. Like we're very concerned about his development. Um, and so for me in evaluating, I thought this is really odd. And, you know, my first thought was, well, maybe one of these is, is inaccurate. And so I did a lot of digging and did a you know, full intake with the resource parent, a full intake with the bio parents. I also had a really long um, conversation with the social worker um, with, with the child and family well-being and talked with their DSEP worker. And so kind of triangulating this information and getting information from all, you know, all sides was really, really informative for me because what was the truth is that he was showing really different behaviors in both settings. Um, and, you know, a lot of it, and I saw it with, with him and with the bio parents in person is that there just seemed to be a really hard time with regulation. Um, he was really dysregulated and also did have this kind of flat affect aside from crying and just being overall kind of upset. And so that really gave me concern for his mental health and um, he's only 15 months old. And although he does have some developmental delays, the kind of putting his behavioral presentation into context with that, you know, the developmental delays were not enough to explain kind of the differences in behavior in both settings. So um, I just give that example of, you know, one, that it's how important it is to gather information from multiple informants when you have the opportunity to, um, and also considering, you know, trauma and, and mental health, even in infants. Well, and you can see why we're all so happy that Dr. Eastless is going to be staying with us long term, because that kind of work, you know, that kind of compassion and willingness to really understand what's going on, you know, how important that was to understand this child, because it had been so easy to just write somebody off. Oh, well, the, you know, one person's not telling the truth, or maybe, you know, they don't know what they're doing, and, and, you know, like, just making other assumptions, and I think, you know, the fact that you, Melina, took that time to really understand what was going on was huge, and, you know, that's a very different treatment plan than somebody who was kind of quick to, make, you know, make an assumption based on how a child presents, and looking at, at things across settings, I think, is so important. I also just would say, too, the other thing is, you know, how important it is not to take any one symptom and make decisions. Oh, well, the child's not making eye contact, therefore they must have dot, 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 you know, that kind of thing. We see that happening. Uh, people will sometimes order one test 
to see if the child has autism. And yet we know, you know, there's so many factors that have to be considered when we're looking at these things. The time is worth it. The time it takes is worth it. It is. <laughs> All right. And so um, we also wanted to, to talk briefly about um, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders um, as they pertain to a child's development and psychosocial context. Um, and so FASD is a lifelong brain and body-based disability and it's resulting from prenatal alcohol exposure. Um, you know, not every child who is exposed to alcohol prenatally will develop fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Um, and, you know, there's no real correlation that exists between the amount of alcohol that a parent, a mom consumed um, and the likelihood of developing uh, FASD. Um, you know, kind of a big takeaway is that there really is no safe amount, no safe time, um, you know, no safe type of alcohol to be consuming during pregnancy. Um, and, you know, of all the substances that people may abuse during pregnancy, alcohol is one, I believe the most common and also produces the most serious neurobehavioral effects. Yes. Um, Even though it's legal, you know, and I think that's something to highlight. And oftentimes pregnancy isn't discovered until after somebody maybe has been, been drinking, they don't realize it, you know, it's usually discovered at, you know, six weeks or later. Uh, and, um, and yet that's, so we may not even know that we're pregnant. And so it's, it's, it's understandable in some ways why it can happen. It's legal. It's a social thing that a lot of people do. And yet we also know how critical it can be to the growing fetus. Yeah. Um, and, and just to add to that, mental health problems are one of the, um, you know, most prevalent outcomes associated with FASD. And so, you know, we're not necessarily diagnosing, or I'm not necessarily diagnosing this in, in our clinic, but um, it is something that I keep an eye out for, especially when asking about the developmental history. Um, and I think going back to that trauma-informed approach, you know, this is can be a difficult thing to talk about and, and even to ask about, um, but I think doing it and making sure that we're asking in a very trauma-informed way and using a similar, you know, kind of lens with, you know, all families, whether it's an adoptive parent or a bio parent or a family member, um, you know, we don't want to just assume that somebody who may have used alcohol while pregnant um, or that the child was exposed to it ultimately leads to poor parenting or something like that. Um, and so, you know, some Criteria for FASD is some facial um, abnormalities. So if you'll see in this picture, there's smaller eye openings, um, a thin upper lip and a kind of smooth philtrum or part of the face right there. Um, there's also some growth deficiencies, either prenatally or um, childhood, um, and then differences in uh, brain growth and development, and there's also neurobehavioral um, impairments. So this you know, can look like functional difficulties, um, cognitive difficulties, and differences in their central nervous system. All right. And so um, this is just a really simplified kind of image to point out all the overlaps between all these different diagnoses. You know, these are some of the mo more common um, kind of diagnoses that we're assessing for in early childhood. And so, um, I, I mean, you can even see this little pink color, or light pink color in the middle is overlapped by all of these. And so I just think that's super, super important to just to, to recognize that, you know, of every single one of these in this list, they all have some things in common. And so, you know, the point, the, you know, being trauma-informed, being comprehensive in our assessments, um, not making assumptions with families. Um, I, I think all those are kind of really important takeaways from this, this image here. I would agree. And I think also asking, you know, especially about that, that question about, you know, drinking during pregnancy. I think that's so important. It's, it's you know, it, it can be really hard to ask 
but so important. And we work a lot with birth, birth parents and resource parents, foster parents, often together. And it can be very challenging to get the truth. But what a gift, you know, to give that child if, if they can really know their true history. Um, it can make a big difference in our treatment planning and how we think about what's going on. So I think part of our job there is to invite that conversation and to destigmatize, you know, whatever the answer is to support that, that truth. So we've got, let's see, 12 minutes doing a time check. I get to tell the story, which is always fun. Um, this little guy, I do have permission to, sh to share his story because the picture is actually my son, who's now 22. But we're going to tell the story of Nathan. And um, what I like about this story is, you know, as Melina shared with the overlapping circles there, you know, it's so easy when you have a child who presents with complexity to not know what's going on. And and I think being okay with that, but still moving into doing something about it is, is the optimal way to approach things. Um, with this little guy, I actually got the uh, privilege of assessing him at three different time points. The first was at two, when he had just been removed from his parents' uh, care. And then I saw him again at three and then at five. And he looked very different each time I saw him. It was remarkable. And, you know, at, at one time point, at two, he was just very dysregulated, and um, I knew mom had um, a big substance use history, so I was wondering about prenatal exposure to alcohol or other drugs. Um, wasn't really sure what was going on or just the, the, the trauma of being removed. Um, lots of, of questions there, and then at three, um, came back, and it was just much more withdrawn, and I'll share more about the what happened at five, but... Um, you know, part of our work when we're looking at um, what's happening with a child, we're looking at their chronological age, and then we're using standardized testing to say, well, where is their developmental level? And so his scores here were part of that process. And at three, my, my scores, I don't have the, the two-year uh, two year old scores, but they were, they were similar to, they were kind of low average to average, similar to three. Um, but you can see that um, over time, uh, he uh, really, things really changed. His scores really changed and his cognitive abilities. And that's not usual to see that, that huge of a, of a, of a shift um, where at by five, his skills were really you know, off the charts and much advanced compared to his, his, uh, his peers. So that was a shift. We'll go to the next slide and we'll show some other shifts. Um, we used some tools uh, to assess what was going on. Um, one tool specifically is called the ADOS, the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule, which is designed to look at symptoms of autism spectrum. Um, there, his, his ratings were very different. Um, you can see the diagnoses were also very different at different time points. And I think different people who worked with this child at different times saw different things. And so that was really hard. Um, but we did right by this little guy um, because we stuck with him and we stuck with how difficult it was. As Melina said, I don't think it's just about being new to your career. I'm not so new to my career, but these kids are hard and we need to give them time to tell us what's going on while also doing as much intervention as we can and watching that response to whatever we're putting in place. And so with Nathan here, we did a lot of different um, types of evaluation and assessment and treatment uh, working with different caregivers. At times he was placed back with bio mom and then went to uh, resource care. And so we were following him through a program that I was uh, a part of and uh, things really shifted. Um, by five, he was in an adoptive home. There was an open adoption with his birth uh, mother who was still involved um, and, and working on her own recovery. Um, but he actually at that point at five did not meet criteria for any diagnoses. He saw his cognitive skills. Um, and he was he was doing well. Now, I think that's remarkable, and I think it's it's good to 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 celebrate that. But it's also important to not hear from this that sort of stability and love is all you need, because he very well could have come out uh, at five and with a very different picture, and and that's okay. You know, it, the important thing is that we're understanding what's going on at the time. You know, I always say a diagnosis is only as good as it as, a, as it, it only works if it's working for the child. So it should be a working diagnosis. You know, is it helping to describe things in, at that point in time? 
And with Nathan, you know, his picture did look different. And I, like I said, I got to see him at different time points and so really saw that. Um, and we did give him that gift of time, but also the help that he needed. And, you know, th this was a while ago, this story. So I'm hoping he's, he's doing well now, but um, he's one that sticks with me. You know, you have those kids that you just kind of hold in your heart and your head for, for your career. And he's definitely one of them. Um, I think we did right by him, which is pretty cool. I actually think about this a lot of times when I'm doing assessment and I know that there's, you know, this complexity and thinking about trauma versus autism. And so, yeah, I hope, I hope this stays with many people as well. Story. All right. So getting close to the end here, just a couple more slides. Um, but, you know, I definitely wanted to, wanted to end this one on kind of a positive note and um, also leaving with you with, Kind of the mindset of what can we do and um you know what what can promote the development of children in, in early childhood specifically and so um there's protective factors and so um i like this kind of um analogy about protective factors and um i wish i had put a visual of this but if we might think of like a maybe a cup of water that has maybe a cup of Kool-Aid that's red. <laughs> um, and maybe you think of that as, you know, the red is like all these stressors and kind of risks that maybe a child has. And the more that you pour in, you know, this clear glass of water where you're, these are kind of the protective factors and, you know, you're not completely mitigating all these risks, but the more and more that you're pouring in, you're kind of filling this cup with more, um, not, not necessarily replacing, but kind of changing the context and, you know, the actual makeup of what it, what is part of this child's life, if you think of it that way. So again, I'm sure a picture would have helped understand that better, but <laughs> all I have to say is that kind of the more protective factors that we can put in, the better. We not might not be able to mitigate all risks that, you know, are in a child's life, but, you know, the more that we can do, the the better. And so um, these are just five um, kind of key protective factors that we wanted to briefly talk about. And so um, one of these is building parental resilience. And so this, you know, I think of our Kids Start program here um, at DEC that serves kind of complex cases um, with children with maybe they have medical complexities or psychosocial complexities um, and also have some developmental concerns. And so one piece of this program that I find is so, so helpful is that there's um, opportunities for parent groups there and they also help connect parents with um, resources for their own mental health and also kind of how to work with um, their children and their children's behaviors. And so I think of that as building parental resilience, one in themselves and, and also, um, you know, their abilities to manage challenging child behaviors. Um, another one is uh, social, social support and social connections. Um, so, you know, whether like kind of, again, when I was just sharing about our concert program, how there's opportunities to attend groups with other parents who are also experiencing similar things. Um, you know, there's also other ways I see it. You know, there's a lot of people from different organizations here at this training today. And um, I think just the fact that you might be from a community organization provides more opportunity to connect families or maybe find other resources in your community to help connect families to. Um, um, or just, you know, talking to parents about ways that they can find, you know, social connection in their everyday day lives. Um, and then, you know, parent parental knowledge of child development, I think is huge. And I think it's really challenging. You know, we're really fortunate to be in this field. And, you know, sometimes I forget, you know, I went to school for many years to learn all these things. And, um, both my parents are educators, so I think a lot of that came from them too early on, but not everybody has, you know, access to all this education. And, um, you know, I don't know what I would know about early childhood development if I didn't have all this formal education. And so I think that, you know, as a society, we can do better about um, helping parents to understand their child and, um, you know, what is typical and what's maybe atypical. Um, and so whether that's in the form of doing I don't know, flyers with information or putting on trainings for families or having support groups, things like that. Um, we can think about creative ways that we can, you know, promote these protective factors in families. Um, 
and then providing concrete support in times of need. So, you know, at, in our program at Radies, we have a care coordinator who I think has been life changing for a lot of families and providing access to resources. Um, so, you know, however you might be able to do that, whatever that looks like in your organization, um, but, you know, providing access to basic needs is another huge protective factor for families. Um, and then building children's social emotional competence. Um, you know, I think I see some some educators here, or people who work one on like directly with um, children in early childhood. And so and I think we even had a question about that come in of like, what can we do to promote um, early childhood de social emotional development? And um, there's so many curriculums and, you know, different ways that you can go about doing that. I don't think there's one specific right way. Um, one program I really like is the Zones of Regulation. Um, there's a lot of free resources on their website uh, for, for families, for, you know, uh, child care providers. So, um, you know, even just talking about your feelings, you know, you don't need to purchase some curriculum or have formal training um, to be able to instill social emotional competence, but maybe just um, teaching parents how to reflect emotions or just helping them to feel more comfortable talking about feelings um, in children can help promote their social emotional competence. All right, sorry I rushed through that a little bit, but I know we're- I'll put the zones in the chat too. <laughs> Short on time. Um, all right, and so I just wanted to end on, you know, really providing this perspective that you are a protective factor for this family. Just being here at this training and wanting to learn about this topic, I think, you know, it shows that you are here to promote the ch a child's development. Um, and, you know, I, I don't, I think we, you know, can't take this lightly, this role that we all have, um, because sometimes in these roles, if, if we're not educated the right way, then sometimes it can be harmful to families. And so um, I just have some kind of list of ways that we can uh, make sure that we are being protective to families um, by one being trauma informed. So you know, utilizing all this information that you learned about today um, when you go and, and work with families or you know, talk with them or the questions that you ask, um, being culturally sensitive. So considering how maybe an individual's cultural experiences might influence their parenting or their relationships or their comfort with um, interacting with mental health services or behavioral health services. Um, knowing the signs of what to look for in um, early childhood mental health, um, being an advocate for families and for children, you know, we are in a privileged position and working in organizations. And um, I think we have a lot of power to advocate, you know, not just on behalf of a single family or individual, but kind of on our communities as a whole and, and our system. So I encourage you all to think about how you might be an advocate for, um, you know, on, on some level of the system. Um, Know, thinking about the language that we use and being strengths-based and affirming of neurodiversity. Um, Self-reflection is a huge one and kind of thinking about what is the lens that I'm viewing this child and this family through? Is it, you know, are my own childhood experiences maybe impacting the way that I'm interpreting this situation? Um, how might I be better about um, talking about this really challenging topic or, you know, doing something better next time, even if I might not have, you know, done everything the way I would have wished I did this time. Um, and lastly, self-care. You know, this, I, I'm sure you guys hear this all the time, but, you know, it's, it's truly, we could not be doing this work without taking care of ourselves first. And so um, I encourage you to, do whatever it is that refills your cup and, and helps you to be the best you to serve the families that we work with. So, yeah, right at four o'clock right now. <laughs> There's one more slide, right, Melina? Oh, well. For the, oh, is there a Caltrans slide? Yeah. There we go. <laughs> So thank you all for being here. Um, we really appreciate you. Great. And to the participants, um, and on behalf of the participants, we just want to say thank you so much for being with us. You can see in the chat how much people really appreciated it. To those of you that have stayed, thank you so much. And we uh, will drop the 
chat in the chat we're going to drop your survey and the information for the CEUs so thank you all so much for being with us and we can't wait to see you again have a great day everybody bye thank everybody have a good night